In an interview with Fox News, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman referred to Saudi Arabia as the biggest success story of the 22nd century. Examining the facts, it's hard to argue. For two consecutive years, the country leads in GDP growth and per capita surpasses France, Italy, Japan, and other historically successful nations. In Saudi Arabia, Formula One racers compete, Cristiano Ronaldo plays, and a cyberpunk city of the future, Neom, is under construction. Settle in comfortably, friends. We're starting a series of videos with a tour of the luxurious Arabian world, which, a century ago, was far from what it is today. The territory of present-day Saudi Arabia is the historical homeland of the Arab tribes that influence the Middle East and Europe. Legendary cities like Mecca and Medina are here, and it has been the battleground for the title of the rightful heir for millennia, involving wars, revolutions, and the influence of major powers. Moving closer to modern times, the Ottoman Empire became a significant power, managing what is now Saudi Arabia. However, the independent Saudi state, living in the past, emerged at least three times. Firstly, in 1744, when the ruler of Riyadh's suburb, Muhammad ibn Saud, conquered Mecca and Medina, establishing the Saudi dynasty. The sequel to the Saudi-Ottoman rivalry didn't take long. By 1824, Riyadh was once again freed from Ottoman influence, and the Emirate of Najd was founded, initially independent but facing persistent struggles for six to seven years against both Ottoman forces and their vassals from the Heil state. Eventually, the Saudi kingdom emerged, gaining independence, and a new era began at the end of the tunnel. The Ottoman Empire struggled and suffered a significant defeat in battles for Riyadh and the Najd region in 1912. From that point, the process of gathering territories and establishing central authority became irreversible. Despite officially recognizing the creation of the state of Saudi Arabia on September 23, 1932, King Abdulaziz Al Saud had been in control since 1920, effectively ruling the country by 1926. The most interesting part began when Britain, the primary player in the region, crumbled. The first state to establish diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia was the unexpected Soviet Union. Karim Hakimov, the head of the Soviet diplomatic mission, adeptly navigated the situation and received Saudi accreditation a year before the British. This Ernad Hakimov, the nickname Red Pasha, and he had direct access to King Al Saud. From then on, the young Arabian state became the top priority for major powers. In the race for influence, the USSR gained an advantage, simply because, as always in relations between Britain and its vassals, the line between love and hatred was thin. In the 1920s, the British aimed to create a unified state in the Middle East, including Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and other countries influenced by the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. Saudi Arabia, after 200 years of fighting for independence, resisted becoming a vassal once again. For a while, the young state even used the balancing act with the USSR as a lifeline, a twist that sounds like a joke. In 1931, a petroleum deal took place where the Soviets supplied Saudi Arabia with 100,000 crates of gasoline and kerosene. Nazir, the turquoise inspector, initially placed the Soviets first, followed by the British and then the French in terms of acceptance. However, like many processes of that time, everything went awry before World War II. Stalin executed both consuls, friends of the Saudi king, on charges of espionage. In return, the king eliminated the Soviet embassy in Jeddah. Ironically, in 1938, monstrous oil reserves were discovered in the country by the British Empire. By then, the Americans had entered the scene, successfully dismantling the British influence. In a period when Saudi Arabia was tired of its lifeline, King Abdulaziz ibn Abdulrahman al Saud granted the US a concession for oil field development and pursued a prudent policy in World War II. The country observed a friendly neutrality towards allies and later became part of the Lend-Lease program. Abdulaziz, until his death, left the country only three times, focusing on internal politics. In 1945, he declared war on Germany to become a full-fledged founder of the UN and the League of Nations. By 1945, the country earned $5 million from oil extraction, rising to $212 million in 1953. Aramco, initially an American company, played a pivotal role. Notably, the process of Aramco's nationalization became a major factor in transforming Saudi Arabia. 
Today, it constitutes 80% of the state's budget revenue. Abdulaziz initiated the corporation's relocation from the U.S. to its homeland in 1950, ensuring that 50% of net profits remained in the Saudi Arabian budget. In 1972, Faisal, the son of the first King Khalid, achieved a 20% stake in the management of Saudi Arabia. By 1980, 100% of the assets of the world's largest oil corporation returned home. This was the work of the next son of the first king, Khalid. However, the turning point in U.S.-Saudi relations happened a bit earlier, precisely during Faisal's reign. Despite Saudi Arabia historically aligning with the Arab-Israeli conflict, dissatisfaction among oil exporters led to the 1973 oil embargo. The Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, where Saudi Arabia was a leader, imposed an embargo on shipments to countries supporting Israel, including the US, Britain, Canada, and Japan. This led to a severe energy crisis in the 1970s, during which Saudi Arabia demonstrated real sovereignty, capitalizing on oil sales due to the embargo, resulting in a substantial price increase. The USSR was fortunate in this scenario, as it started supplying oil to the West instead of Saudi Arabia, profiting from the soaring prices. However, by the mid-1980s, the USSR suffered when oil prices plummeted. Many directly link Saudi Arabia's policy as to the Soviet Union's collapse, as its budget, heavily reliant on oil revenue, went awry. A pivotal moment was the establishment of the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia in 1971. This fund facilitated not just oil sales but also infrastructure development. For instance, with funds from the Sovereign Wealth Fund, the country rapidly achieved self-sufficiency in wheat production by purchasing wheat from local farmers at prices three times higher than global rates. This success recipe extended to other areas of life, with similar schemes applied. However, it's crucial not to idealize the political landscape. The ruling family of Saudi Arabia currently comprises up to 15,000 individuals with various interest groups, and the System's Balancing Act during the 1970s and 1980s was not always smooth. King Faisal, who initiated the energy crisis, was assassinated by his nephew. A bit earlier, his predecessor Saud fled to Geneva and the country faced corruption, nepotism, and many shady dealings where certain clans established entire ministries to grab their share of the oil pie. In essence, historians here are divided into two groups. The first claims that there were many issues in Arabia, but there were even more petrodollars. This wealth marked the beginning. The second group of historians believes that internal disputes within the royal family should not underestimate efforts to improve the welfare of the population. In Saudi Arabia, even the top positions in the central bank were granted to commoners and foreign consultants. The result was one of the most efficient bureaucratic banking systems on the planet. Many such examples led to the private sector constituting 30% of the country's GDP by the end of the 1970s. While it might seem modest at first glance, the trend is clear. Having earned from oil, the second stage of economic improvement was announced, the diversification of the economy. Saudi Arabia decided to invest its oil revenues to earn from other sectors in the future. A prominent example of this new policy is wheat. In the 1990s, due to lavishly funded agriculture, Saudi Arabia was one of the main wheat exporters. However, by 2016, it was importing almost 100% of its wheat. The solution was simple. Realizing that exporting a product that requires a substantial amount of water in one of the driest regions on the planet was irrational and costly. Saudi Arabia opted to import wheat and focus on earning in other areas. The country's strategy extended to acquiring corporations globally, including Uber, SoftBank, General Electric, Disney, and Bank of America. The list of corporations partially or wholly acquired by Saudi Arabia could go on endlessly. Even Elon Musk mentioned that in 2018, he was offered a complete buyout of Tesla. In 2022, Saudi Arabian investors reportedly assisted Elon Musk in purchasing Twitter. In essence, having gained sovereignty, the country effectively navigated between the desires of major powers, efficiently invested oil revenues, and is currently striving to earn from diverse sectors of the economy. As of 2019, 38% of Saudi Arabia's population comprises migrants from poorer countries, working in factories in the service sector where salaries are not particularly high. While the state boasts a significant number of millionaires and billionaires per capita, it's essential to remember the broad spectrum of the ruling family and its affiliates. 
The life of ordinary workers is simpler, but Saudi Arabia provides free education and numerous opportunities for them. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an update.